All right, Richie Myers, we are here for the No So Post Show at WWE Crown Jewel Edition. Overall, what's your thoughts on the 2024 edition of Crown Jewel? About what I expected, you know, this was the uh, the fill the gap pay per view, so to speak. You know, it's the uh, midpoint of all the major stories, or a lot of the people on the show. They were just kind of uh, on this show to kind of uh, weave and bridge together everything until Survivor Series and give them something to do, especially with the new Crown Jewel Championship for the men and the women. So it was just one of those shows where it's a means to an end. Just like it is what it is. Nothing really too offensive. Nothing too shocking. And um, again, didn't really have high expectations going into the show. So I'm not underwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed. I'm just whelmed is the best description <laughs> of it. Yeah, uh, I don't think we have the stigma of the 2018, 19, 20, pre-COVID era Saudi Arabia shows where they were just brutally stinky. Um, I think they've done a good, decent job of rehabbing them. Purpose really helps them. And We'll get into it, but having a crown jewel championship is purpose. Perhaps not maybe the most <laughs> generic. Pur it's more generic purpose than not, but it's purpose. Uh, seven matches. We can kind of see now why we had seven advertised matches. And yeah, overall, boring, but good, right? Safe, but exciting enough, but mostly dull for what should be dull and very good for what should be very good. So paint by numbers is the way to describe it. And you are correct. And let's kind of get right into it here, Richie. All right. Opener Roman Reigns and the Usos reuniting to face the new bloodline. And that is so Sokoa, Tamatanga and Jacob Fatu Tangaloa, just like you predicted would not be in this match. And it was probably the right call. Um, earlier in this new bloodlines entrance, they established the through line throughout this pretty much feud leading in that the new bloodline respects in love solo because he respects and love them back. Unlike the way Roman Reigns led the bloodline and the way Roman Reigns blood red blood led the bloodline kind of shows why they're at ease right now and so on and so forth where. You know, we, they're not together yet, and there's such bad will, and we have all these baby faces that need to come back together, but the past has fractured them to a point. And we saw that at the end of this match, but leading into this match, we would see Solo Sokoa win, Solo Sokoa's team win in 16 minutes and 35 seconds. I thought it was pretty much paint by numbers through all the Bloodline matches. Overall, very good at times, but towards the end, the heat on Jimmy was smart. The hot tag for Roman was even smarter to kind of have him build up for that as he's transitioning into this mega baby face, right? So I felt that the structure of this match was solid and kind of on point for what it should be. But I think we saw a little lightness and man, that Jimmy felt super late, kind of took you out of it as well towards the end. But you predicted so Roman Reigns would get pinned here. I kind of pushed back on it just because I think that, that should be held more special. And you predicted Solo Sokoa as well would pin him. And I felt that Solo Sokoa didn't really earn that equity of a Roman Reigns pin, even though that's where they're eventually going, of course. And I, But I liked that Jacob Fatu, when the referee was down, kind of did the dirty work to get Roman in the ground. And then it took two Samoan spikes to end him. Overall thoughts in this match, Richie? And uh, a Barry Horowitz pat on the back on the calling this finish. Hey, thank you. Uh, I think it's one of those things where it's like, again, like the OGs are together, but they're not together, you know, uh, with and that was more uh, nothing more apparent than Jay coming out by himself, you know, still with uh, his entrance music. And, you know, that tension is still there between Jay and Roman. And you saw it during the match where Jay would just tag Jimmy, not Roman. Yeah. And you would uh, build up until that J tag to Roman finally. And then you had Sami Zayn come in at the end. But like I said, with uh, the build to this match, and I think we discussed it on, on it during our preview, hasn't been really the cleanest. You know, everything just kind of like was fast forward. So the quickest and I hate to say easiest way to just kind of get everything in motion 
and to have this new bloodline be a more serious threat and if you're paying off to war games is you have solo pin roman and then they're on the back foot and then roman needs to evaluate that he needs needs to change things and you saw that at the end of the match which was very parallel-esque with cody Rhodes sitting up like after uh his loss to the rock at uh <laughs> WrestleMania and with roman where it's like roman con- yeah yeah so it's like similar thing right there and where roman has to come to terms like he created all this this is all of his doing for better or for worse whether he's good or bad he never actually apologized to jay he never apologized to jimmy he never apologized to anybody he's wronged you know so and that's the next phase of development if you want him to be on this redemption tour now i'm not saying he has to you know do the john cena playbook be smiling happy all that kind of thing but he needs to show some remorse in order to develop that character and going into war games and with this match right here they gave you the you know the meats and potatoes of the whole thing they didn't do anything flashy they didn't do anything out of this world it was just enough to get by to war games so they didn't reveal too much but they revealed enough where it's like okay this is potentially how a war games match would be structured later down the line yes and now that we've concluded talking about the match, what did you think of the post-match angle where we would see the bloodline, the new bloodline, get in there and just continually beat down Roman, continually beat down Jimmy, and then they would finally have Jay cornered in the ring and kind of go for the kill, and then Sami Zayn's music would hit because his close personal brother, right, so to speak, was in danger. And I like how they paid that off. And I like that all four kind of recruited found Solo in the middle of the ring, and then Solo was kind of dead for rights. I think we'll probably see a harpening back to that maybe in the Blood Games. And then Sami Zayn in Roman Reigns, Roman for a spear, Sami for a haluva kick, simultaneously went for the finish or kill of Solo Sokola, and then we saw a haluva kick right to Roman Reigns' face. Sami left distraught a little bit after that. Solo walked away laughing, and the bloodline is even stronger, and maybe the old OG bloodline is even more fractured coming out of this, and there's more rehab to do with these guys. What did you think of even putting those two farther apart for they can come closer together? Did you think that was an effective angle? Uh, for what it was, yeah, absolutely. You know, If you want to have Sammy involved some way, and they teased it uh, on the Raw before, you have to have his inclusion sooner rather than later because – War Games is just around the corner. And for a post-match angle, you know, they teased it on a Raw and yeah. Sammy attacking Solo and then Sammy kicking Roman as Roman's going for the spear. And Jimmy not trusting Sammy because of what happened with uh, Roman at the Rumble when Sammy hit the, uh, used the chair against him. And then you have all these complex relationships. And that's yes. what why people really do like the Bloodline story because everyone's relationship with each other is different yes. and is expanded upon. So now is the point where it's like you're going to have a couple of weeks of just, you, you know, doom and gloom for the good guys until everyone decides to unite on the same page. And again, this match really showed that Jay isn't on the same page with Roman. He's on the same page with Jimmy, but not Roman. Sammy's back. Jay's his guy, but he doesn't like Jimmy. Jimmy doesn't like Sammy. So Roman. <laughs> There's a lot of drama, you know, and some people like it. Some people don't like it, but it is an engaging story for a lot of the audience. And I feel like the post-match angle, post-match attack was very effective. I feel like with So Sokoa, he's finally found his groove as like this like slimy leader. You know, I think before he was just trying to be like a pseudo like uh, kingpin kind of boss. And now he's just more of a slimy, arrogant kind of guy. And I feel like yeah. it's such like a detour from when Roman was the tribal chief that he's making it his own. Not saying they're at all comparable, but now Solo's in a comfortable role within his bloodline. And if this is going to be more towards the end of Slo- Solo's bloodline, you know, after war games, then it might be a little bit uh, too little too late. But Solo is finally in a role where he is seemingly thriving right now. Yeah, the, that role of Solo Sokoa kind of, you see the pivot within him, right? You, he mm-hmm. kind of got that insecurity of not being able to dethrone Cody and being the true tribal chief because 
the old tribal chief was the tribal chief because he had the title, which ca called all the power and so forth. So now he's just like, all right, well, now I need to kind of be insecure, rely on the things that I've isolated myself with to kind of make myself the quote unquote tribal chief. And now he's like feeding his pit bulls to kind of build him up and them kind of doing the work here. And we see that in the finish here as well. So slimy is a great word for solo instead of like kingpin because it was fake right it didn't mm -hmm. feel organic it didn't feel like it should have or could have been or it was really but i like that yes it's upper mid card with flirting with main event it's not withstanding at the main event but it is becoming something in the slimy lane you hit it right on the nail there for sure mm -hmm. um do you in retrospect i felt that this match was rushed like mm -hmm. including it on this pay-per-view uh, after Roman and Jay's entrance, you were like, all right, I can see why they're on this pay-per-view. This crowd is going absolutely ballistic. I'm sure there's favors that need to be made and promises need to be kept. And it just felt that we weren't at the point in the storyline to have physicality. But in retrospect, I will say hand up. Yes, of course, they did the right thing by having this match here and doing it in front of the crowd here and setting up the end of November. So they're going in the right direction. We have, I, I assume this is going to be Raw and SmackDown based for the most part, mostly SmackDown, but I feel that we're going to get a little Raw and SmackDown intertwining, you know, intertwining there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would leave about eight or so episodes of episodic WWE TV to get us there. Do you think there's enough meat on the juice to get us there? Obviously we're getting there, but do you think they have enough time is what I'm saying to have full investment? I mean, people are invested in the bloodline story anyway, you know, whatever Roman Reigns does, people are going to pay attention. So it's kind of inconsequential to see whether the build is going to match that. Now, creatively, you can make an argument that this was rushed and there were a lot of things that were fast forward. And I do agree with that. And I, I think for the most part, it's like they were trying to jam in, you know, two months of stories uh, or or four months of stories into two months. You know what I mean? With Jay winning the IC title and then quickly losing it, like everything is going really, really fast. And I think a lot of this bloodline story, it's a lot of start and stop kind of progression because. It was almost like when Roman was around as champion, you know, some like he'll be there for a couple of weeks and then he's off. He'll be there, then he'll be off. And it's just like you can only see the bloodline beat down one too many times before you're like, all right, let's get to the point. And I think a lot of people are at the point where it's like, all right, let's rip the band aid off. Let's like we know the story beats that are going to happen. And this match, which I agree would be early, but at the same time, when else would this match really take place logically? Sure. You know, and you need to have that bloodline dominance other than a beatdown. And you need that uh, official win over Roman Reigns, Jimmy and Jay to show how much uh, this is a new threat of this bloodline and give so Sokoa that win that he sorely needed since, you know, post SummerSlam. And that this is exactly how you do it. You know, people might feel mixed on the match. I know it's like, it was kind of like paint by numbers, one by one, like uh, one, uh, one by one and, uh, or one on one. And then you have uh, Roman's matches are very like old school house show based matches anyway. So there's going to be criticism on that front as well. So again, it was a definition of, we need this match to tie into the next show. And did its job, you know, not really offensive one way or the other. Gave Solo a big win. So now Solo joins Cody and Jay as the only people to pin Roman since Roman won the championship. And uh, I believe it was payback 2020. Yeah. yeah. And mind you, Jay and Solo both being in tag matches in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia. So, mm -hmm. well, actually, was it London? that It was London for Jay. Yeah, it was London for Jay. I was off there. So, yeah, overall. Very good match. Do you think we'll see Paul Heyman in, within this month before War Games to kind of put the OGs back together? I think so. You know, you need that common thread. You need that wise man to talk some sense into the the tribal chief, the OTC. So that's what you got to do. And I think the wise man is the last piece of that puzzle that will tie everything together. Excellent. All right, cool. All right, we have a comment here. Memphis 
Continental Wrestling Cast says hello, and he is watching. Hello. So. All right. Second match here we had Damage Control, EO Sky and Kyrie Sane versus Metaphor, Lash Legend and Jakara Jackson versus Chelsea Green and Piper Niven versus your WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, Jade Cardgill and Bianca Belair. Belair and Jade winning in 12 minutes even. I felt the crowd was surprisingly into this match for what it was. It was in a tough spot coming off of Roman, but unfortunately... Well, fortunately for me, uh, the biggest star in this match continues to be Chelsea Green. She, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, I felt that the crowd was yearning for her. I felt that she looked great. And <clears throat> nine minutes was kind of the perfect length for these girls to go out there and have a successful match. I think they outkicked their coverage in a foot phrase for football. You know, I think it was pretty good for what it was, Richie. I thought it was well paced and strong. What did you think of this match? I think the the sneaky thing WWE is doing right now is developing the WWE women's tag team roster in general because majority of the pay-per-views since post WrestleMania have featured the women's tag team championships and you could uh, argue that they, these are like four legitimate teams that WWE is kind of building at this point uh, and, and the story did make sense relatively when they were building on television across all um all two shows three shows if you want to count nxt yeah i thought and, that was the dual aspect of it too as well each show yeah, is represented. So, yeah each show represented i think uh metaphor like was were quietly called up to smackdown uh just waiting for the official word on that but you again so. it's, yeah you know it's like they've been making frequent appearances on smackdown so i wouldn't see oh uh, why not i'm cool for it. i think personally i don't think they would fit in the NXT landscape on the tag division, in my opinion. I just think that they're just kind of in their own universe, killing it, and I just don't feel like they would fit. They would definitely fit more on a SmackDown. Right, yeah, and uh, like you said, Chelsea Green continues to make uh, the mm -hmm. little moments that she has mean a lot more with her uh, character segments, you know, stealing She's the show, good. which shows that it's like, it's not always about moves, but as long as you have a personality people can connect with, the moves and stuff will come after the fact. And the finish definitely played into the Piper Niven, Chelsea Green dynamic as well. And you have, uh, again, all these talented women in this match. Um, it, it, you know, it's one of those things where I think people are kind of getting tired of the Bianca and Jade pairing just because what else do you have left to do with them as a team? Mm -hmm because now they're pretty much winning legitimately against every team sooner rather yeah. than later, you're going to run out of teams. So I think that's the small problem, but you're building up this, these tag team champions as dominant forces. And when's the last time have we seen like, especially in the women's tag team division, they, them taking the champions that seriously. So it, it's one of those things where, like I would like more like focus on the women's tag teams and just have like more of a story. But again, they, they did a nice story here, like on television, building up this match and the women did great. So uh, it's yeah, about I, what, what I expected. Yeah. I feel that there was putting some emphasis on potentially Bel Air and Jade sooner than later, kind of breaking away and going somewhere. I talked in the bloodline solo entrance, laying the foundation of that story. In the Bel Air and Jade's entrance, they were kind of like, oh, there's been a little dissension between these two. And I'm like, has there been? But anyways, that's that's a through line that could start to develop sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so it just kind of uh, just kind of depends where they want to take the tag team division and if they still want to push Jade and Bianca. And then, you know, sky's the limit for any of these women's and women involved. And I can't wait to see what else they have planned? All right. In the next match here, Seth Rollins would go on to defeat Bronson Reed in 12 minutes and 20 seconds via pinfall. I believe they had like a two to three, even four minute brawl beforehand uh, pre-match. I don't know. I felt a little underwhelmed with this personally. 
you can't I can't call this like a bad match. I can't really call it a boring match, but it was just felt a little underwhelming. I have never really necessarily been a massive Bronze of Green fan, but he's growing on me. <coughs> <clears throat> so I feel. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where it's like Bronson's been getting a lot of momentum recently. He's been getting a lot of, you know, visually dominating stuff that uh, features Seth Rollins. And with Bronson Reed in general, I think a win would have really solidified himself and WWE's push behind him because then. You have a, a legitimate win under Bronson Reed's belt. And with Seth Rollins winning here, not that it's bad, but you had the angle on Raw essentially giving Seth an out if Seth were to lose here because they had that angle with him going to the local medical facility about his back. And I think that would have been a perfect way out for him and reason why he would lose. Didn't happen that way. You know, you had the three curb stomps, the unique curb stomps uh, that took out Bronson Reed. And the visual of like that trickle of blood just like coming down there. I think it was a strong visual. So I don't think Bronson lost anything necessarily, but Bronson Reed still needs to get that something to solidify that matchup and solidify his positioning on the card so that this uh, push that he's getting isn't just like he's going to be the monster that Seth is going to overcome. You need to give him at least something when it comes to just that overall you need him to get solidified as a contender and i think on raw we're going to see bronson cost seth the fatal four-way that was announced tonight for the number one contendership for the world title and then you could have him win the second match if that's the direction they want to go yeah it's a decent building block there right mm -hmm. let's not put let's reverse roles you figured that reed would get the first win mm -hmm. but that would maybe propel him in the world heavyweight title match on raw. So let's have raw Rollins get the win. Reed still looks and feels dominant, even though I think the loss kind of limits him a little bit, especially with the back to back loss with Strowman, even though they both were caused by, you know, over arrogance or whatever. So I feel that Reed's still in a good spot, but if he was to go on to Raw and lose that world heavyweight title, perhaps with Rollins screwing him, I feel that the reverse roles is better with Rollins going, being bulletproof, going get screwed by Reed, like you mentioned. That's mm -hmm. a good call. I can see that happening. Even though they kind of dwelled a little bit on maybe perhaps this being a little over, but I don't I don't think it is. I think that we can maybe get to it. Uh, who do you mm -hmm. while we're on that subject? Who do you think wins that fatal four way? I think Priest wins it. And then you think it sets up war games or Saturday night's main event? Probably sets up war games. Yeah, timing wise, right? That makes mm -hmm. a little bit more sense for sure. Yeah, I mean, they could do Dominic, you know, but I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure after what we saw tonight, it would be pretty entertaining if it was Dominic that won, but, uh, Dom already got the pinfall on Priest, and I feel like this is when Priest kind of like bounces back, and then uh, he gets his one back, hypothetically. And then uh, they've already been building Priest and uh, Gunther a little bit, and I, I think Survivor Series is probably the time to do it. Yeah, so Sheamus has been a little low-key on a hot streak as well, right? All, guy, all three guys, Priest, all three guys, Dominic, Sheamus, and Rollins coming off pretty big wins. Mm -hmm. And then you have priests. So it, booking wise, you can see them setting up priests to look stronger by defeating three hotter guys coming in. And that fluke pin, pinfall by Dom mm -hmm. won't necessarily hurt him, right? It was more of a, yeah. are you going to be shitting me type of thing? Like you yeah. caught me, you son of a bitch. Yeah. So, and I, I think like uh, if they won't really want to do it, no, I don't think they will because they're taping their show on Sunday in Saudi Arabia. But if they had Bronson take out Seth beforehand and then you have Punk replace Seth as a, like a surprise entrant and then he, he faces Gunther, which gives more tension to the Punk-Seth relationship because Punk took Seth's spot. Yeah, but like again, like I said, Saudi Arabia, that's hard to pull is. off. So it's like it's going to be tricky to pull off. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Damian Priest gets it. But uh, Bronson takes out Seth and then, you know, you just kind of uh, continue the feud from there. Yeah. I'm curious what that looks like from a presentation standpoint, raw in Saudi Arabia, 
it's interesting. It's probably going to be the same set we saw tonight. <coughs> oh, that then that's a massive set, right? So yeah. But do you feel disappointing in this match, or am I just kind of a little off my? No, I, I've been on the Bronson train since this whole thing started, and, and like Bronson didn't really, you know, didn't really have anything to uh, pick up from, and with Bronson Reed in general. It's like you need that solidified win in order to give him credence. He needs to be given everything, uh, essentially, when it comes to a sanctioned victory. You know, all the attacks are cool, like the every all the visual stuff, like the Bronson, uh, Braun Strowman car tsunami, the six tsunamis to Seth Rollins, the tsunamis to our truth, all of them visually impressive. But if you don't pick up that W eventually, then it's going to be kind of all for naught. And I think with Bronson, this was probably this was probably the safest time to give him a win, in my opinion. But with Seth Rollins, you know, uh, conquering hero, they still wanted to depict him as, uh, you know, still that baby face that they want to <clears throat> showcase. And he hasn't gotten a win on, in a while on pay-per-view. So you need to display that as, hey, Rollins is still... Of one of our guys in WWE, but Bronson could have really benefited it from here. So I think the win here for Rollins, no harm, no foul, and unless uh, they don't give Bronson a really good win down the line. Yeah, I just think as of right now, he's that strong gatekeeper, right? Like that mm -hmm. Sheamus role, that Umaga role, that's kind of his ceiling right now. But mm -hmm. we'll see if he gets there one day. Again, he's kind of growing on me, I guess, because before... I just never really connected with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's been done tremendous work. Yeah, this is one match that I didn't really connect with off the jump, and that is Liv Morgan defeating Nia Jax in eight minutes and fifteen seconds. No heat, no interest. Uh, it was I. I felt for the girls really. Two heels going out there. It felt like they were forced fed into. I wouldn't even call it a feud. This match. Mm -hmm. uh, they used deodorant of money in the bank to kind of take out the stink. And even that angle felt stinky. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Just, just bad. Like it was, it rarely ever is anything bad in the WWE nowadays. Just heatless. Um, like they worked fine. It was all right. It was just fine at best. And, you know, for nowadays, that's just, just isn't enough in, for, in my opinion. I felt underwhelmed and disinterested in this match. And it was a tough eight minutes to get through, in my opinion. It was only eight minutes. So I don't know. Am I being a little too rough on the girls, perhaps? But they're, it's not really on them. They should just never been booked together in this match. Yeah, you know, it's a difficult spot to be in, uh, especially being heel versus heel. And you're trying to get both heels over until their challengers come back. In the case of Nia, uh, presumably Charlotte Flair, you know, build off the queen yeah. versus queen thing. And with Liv, you know, with Rhea Ripley recently off the shelf. Uh, and you still got to develop, you know, the Raquel, the Dominic pairing as an effective pairing for Liv Morgan. So her going over, I do understand. Uh, because then you could kind of tie that in. Like every time like Liv takes out Rhea Ripley, she keeps winning and getting all these opportunities. Because if you remember the first time she uh, she won at Saudi Arabia, I believe, for the World Women's Championship. And now she's the first ever crown jewel female champion, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's tough. Like, you know, uh, the the Tiffany Nia story is still going strong. And with the miscommunication of Tiffany trying to cash in when Nia said it wasn't time yet. And then that leading distraction leading for Nia to lose, I think is a good story beat for their issue later down the line. Uh, but again, it's one of those uh matches where you, you know you struggle to care about it because these two are kind of like in the midst of their own heel act that are continually developing but they're not developing with each other this is like a stop gap for both of them so it almost didn't matter who won this match other than the claim to be the first ever crown jewel champion so again feel for these girls but you know didn't connect and uh not really surprised about like uh, people's reaction to the match. Yeah, it's just kind of is what it is, right? So mm -hmm. they they were dealt a bad hand, and it played out that way. So mm -hmm. kind of is what it is.
Yeah. All right. This next match here. Was it a match? <laughs> but I'm not I mad at it whatsoever. I thought the angle was fantastic. I similar to like the bloodline, I had the same vibes of this match kind of doesn't have the heat that it should have, despite mm -hmm. the potential that it will have. And goddamn, it will have that potential when it lives to up to it that one time we get it. I thought that Kevin Owen was calculated, uh, attacking Randy Orton with the chair. When he stunned the referee, I kind of had that five of what we were getting. They would go on to have like a five to ten minute angle where it was mass chaos. First of all, wearing the ball, Cowboy Bob or Orton shirt, fantastic touch. I, he was doing it with Dusty, and that was too easy. But to dust mm -hmm. off a Cowboy Bob Orton shirt, phenomenal. I loved it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's the aware, but it plays into this new Kevin Owens character. The aware, mm -hmm. unaware Kevin Owens, right? He's aware, but he's playing unaware. So mm -hmm. it's deliberate. It's smart. It's calculated. And it's hints of a more mature, previously healed Kevin Owens character that we have. So I have massive upside for this new turn. Kevin Owens, new contract. I I feel that it's going to go his way. Always a Triple H guy, right? Mm -hmm. Off screen, of course. So, I don't know. I feel that his time is coming, and I would put him as a dark horse to perhaps dethrone Cody Rhodes, if not sooner rather than later. Uh, I think that it was it's warranted. Of course, they even mentioned in the pre-show or even around this match that Kevin – last four years has been in and out with the bloodline hampered by the bloodline and what I think that can be put into a plat platform to elevate him even higher up that card, because honestly he's been a gatekeeper. Like we just gave Bronson Reed that gatekeeper lingo earlier yeah, mo moniker. Yeah. It's for sure. Ben Kevin Owens on absolutely in retrospect, the last four or five years. So I think that a big time push is coming his way and I think he's going to hit it out of the park. Yeah. You know, you said a lot of valid stuff there with Kevin Owens and concerning his character. I think a lot of people expected to see like a new side of Kevin Owens or an old Kevin Owens side. And this one is, you know, trying to feign sympathy over what's been going on with him. You know, he attacked Cody Rhodes he, for teaming with Roman, presumably he attacked Randy Orton for attacking him. But the way that they're writing the Kevin Owens character in general is that Kevin Owens believes he's in the right, but how he is solving th these problems and issues, he's completely in the wrong in how he's solving them. You know, he's just flying off at the handle. He's not communicating his feelings. He feels hurt, and all of this has been building up since the whole Bloodline stuff has going, like been going for him. And he's taking it out on Cody Rhodes. He's taking it out on Randy Orton. And his heel turn has been one of the more intriguing uh, stories that's been going in WWE. Because Triple H really does like the heels that have the uh, a validity in why they turn heel. The best bad guys are always believe they're in the right. And you yeah. can see their perspective. But how they execute that perspective, they should be completely in the wrong in how they solve it. And Kevin Owens here, you know, like you mentioned, the Cowboy Bob Orton shirt, the attack, the stunners, uh, Randy Orton hit the RKO and Adam Pierce. So I'm interested to see how that um, goes uh, over down the line. And then Kevin Owens, well, <laughs> and Kevin Owens hitting the elbow off the uh, top of that truss area. And it really is great, uh, a fun way to develop Kevin Owens as this character. And as this new character where it's like, he's not the prize fighter. He, he, like he said during that whole kickoff show yesterday, his heart was legitimately broken in his, in his mind by both Cody Rhodes and Randy Orton. So now it's like, this is our first time seeing him pretty much on screen, you know, like with, uh, with the exception being on SmackDown, uh, attacking, uh, Randy in front of the live audience. So he's picking apart Randy Orton bit by bit. And it's going to culminate into this whole transition on how Kevin Owens now is this uh, detestable character when he finally get, goes up against Cody. Because if he goes up against Cody right now, you do have a potential, you know, 50-50 split or a 60-40 split because Kevin Owens, uh, people still think he's in the right. You still need to have him do 
some very despicable things like the top like the top trust elbow drop was cool but you still gotta have that despicableness in him where it's like look he has a point but this guy just went way too far yeah uh the the calculated mature kevin owens has a bright future and i'm really excited to see it am i nuts by saying he's a dark horse to dethrone cody rhodes Mm -hmm. am i nuts or you you kind of see it I see your perspective. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah. Uh, because Kevin Owens, he does deserve a world championship yeah. or WWE championship. He's definitely earned it. He's been in this position of lukewarmness when it comes to his character. You know, when he was drafted to SmackDown, there didn't really have much for him. He was in that U.S. title feud with Logan Paul. Then the partnership with Orton was fun. But he wasn't even uh, uh, like lighting the world on fire when it came yeah. to victories or anything like that on television so now you kind of give him a soft reboot where it's like triple h is talking him up randy orton's talking him up as this dangerous kind of lunatic like all flies off the handle kind of guy and you got to still keep building that up so people can believe this isn't going to be the same kevin owens that faced cody Rhodes at bash at, yeah. at berlin you know th this isn't the kevin owens that's going to hesitate to take anybody out so I can't wait to see how they play with it even further. For sure. All right. The United States title three-way in the semi-main event here. I thought this was perfect mm -hmm. placement. Let's talk card so far. So we have a very good, but a little bit underwhelming bloodline match. We have a uninterested, but outkicked its coverage women's match. Rollins in Reed, solid, but boring. Liv and Nia, zero chance. In Vec Inve inject KO and in, in, or in chaos in my veins, but no real match, a little bait and switch, but I, I would put that on a platform of a good call. And then we had this match. It's a little cold coming in, in my opinion, right? We had the game seven sacrifice, even though I think we'll get to it in a few weeks. I feel that it was sacrificed for this Saudi Arabia match, especially including LA Knight leading into it. Having him be the referee was weird in that moment, but of course it was what the reasoning to get us here. And this match, in my opinion, was very WrestleMania 22-esque with Kurt Angle, Rey Mysterio, and Randy Orton, where they went out there and had that nine-minute sprint. And it was near falls, it was action-packed, and it was fastly paced. In my opinion... This that structure was this, but the near falls and the counters and the action was so smooth, and the near falls were more believable because they did a such a good job. Mello and Carmelo have unbelievable chemistry, being their eighth match in the last I don't know three four months or whatever, and then inject L.A. Knight into this, who is over his rover, especially in this crowd, and L.A. Knight would go on to win at nine minutes and ten seconds. I honestly can't say enough about this match. I was totally surprised. Like I said earlier, it was a little cold for me coming in. Maybe that set the bar low, but I thought the, the structure and the pacing was perfect for what this was. And I don't, I don't think Melo and Andrade are necessarily hurt coming out of this. I think they can go on to have their game seven and that bad game seven decision was just a blimp on the road and coming out of, that seven match series, they're both going to be better for it. What's your overall sentiment on all of that in the U.S. title? I think since L.A. Knight won the U.S. title, he's been in this merry-go-round of same contenders for that championship. You know, he it's Andrade, it's Carmelo, it's Santos. It's a revolving door of all three. And I feel like with L.A. Knight, he hasn't really had that feud that is gripping, where it's like L.A. Knight and this person has a heated feud. They're going to go for the U.S. title. So, yeah. and the other thing is with L.A. Knight, he successfully defended his U.S. title against both these guys before in singles matches. Great call. And, yes. and, and the thing is, like, uh, that was prior to the Game 7. So him being the referee was pretty much inconsequential, and it was just a reason for this triple threat match to happen. That being said, I'm glad that L.A. Knight came off with the win because then you can transition Andrade and Melo doing their thing. You could possibly do, like... Uh, you know, you know, game eight to see who wins the. Uh, that doesn't have who, really who, have the ring to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, 
uh, like uh, necessarily on who is the better person. You could do the bar kind of deal and have Andrade and Melo as a tag team if you really want to give them a break from the U.S. title scene. But like, all these guys worked well together. I'm so happy that Andrade and Melo both got a pay per view to shine because those matches on SmackDown were great. But you know they're hampered by commercial breaks, uh, pitcher and pitcher something that will ruin the flow of the match. So I'm glad they were able to get their showcase here at crown jewel. And with LA Knight, I I do applaud him for trying the leapfrog, but he almost <laughs> crotched. He, he crotched himself really, <laughs> really bad. Uh, but you know, everybody performed this match almost flawlessly besides that point. Uh, I thought the finish was great. I thought it was very creative and you know, LA Knight winning. What, what more can you say? I um, just wonder uh, what he's going to do after all of this. Like, I am a pretty big LA Knight fan, so yeah, I don't, I don't mean to throw any <laughs> LA Knight slander, and I usually defend it. But what, what is a LA Knight match if there's not a little botch in it, right? So, I it mean, it's a, it it's it's that uh, John Cena effect, you know? It's not never going to be the prettiest kind of ma- uh, like a move uh, or a attempt yeah. of a move that's going to happen, and there's always going to be some clunkiness involved. But that's yeah. just kind of like what makes him hit him. For sure. All right, Richie. We, this would lead us to the main event. I'm glad this closed, right? Mm-hmm. Just for these two guys, right? Not this title, not the stipulation of being the first crown jewel champ, not the Super Bowl mm-hmm. ring that they would get, but the presentation of the two world heavyweight champions being put together. I did not want the bloodline to overshadow that. I felt that these guys deserved to be in the main event. And they went out there and had a very old school main event feel match. The crowd was at 11, you know, even the, the meter, if that's gimmicked or not, probably gimmicked was off the charts. And as soon as the bell rang, the crowd was yearning for it. And they went out there and had a pretty modern day Gunther main event presentation which Cody fits fantastically, right? Cody is actually a really flexible worker, Mm -hmm. as is Gunther, mind you. And you saw a lot of that flexibility within Gunther today. He wasn't very reliant on the chops and the in the power for moves. He's out here leapfrogging Cody. He's he's has the fast pace. He's jumping around, moving the but they not didn't necessarily go to the floor or whatever. I know they did the the apron spot or whatever, but this majority was in the ring, in between the ropes. And they went out there and told a very compelling story, which led to the finish of the WrestleMania 8-esque Cody Rhodes, cutter, catch him, sleeper, but rolls him, leverage pin, one, two, Gunther's face looks like he's going to kick out at two and a half, but Cody powers his shoulders to the mat for the three count. And I said, oh, wow. Because I, I was looking at Gunther's facial expression, and that added extra, like, dire straits of showing that he's going to kick out. But Cody just really, with that amateur wrestling, holding his mat, shoulder to the mat style, I thought it was excellent. A little shocking. I thought that Gunther was going to win. I, maybe I suspected a little interference. I didn't think Goldberg because of the Hall of Fame in Georgia and Florida, but maybe we get a little KO spillover, especially off the angle, right? And yeah, they went out there, told a compelling story. I don't know if it's as good as the Orton one that I was super high on from Bash of Berlin, but overall, the bar is great, and they matched that bar for a Gunther match. I thought it was excellent. I agree, and uh, you might remember for the preview, I actually pitched this finish of you know the sleeper into the roll up mm-hmm. because that's what the story was all about you know it was Gunther especially saying, last night on SmackDown him tapping him up you know right and, and with Gunther the the whole time saying that Cody was the secondary champion you mm-hmm. know what I mean Cody's the secondary champion there's a and Gunther thinks he has it all figured out but if you look at the story of Cody Rhodes and Gunther since the beginning and I'm talking about the Royal Rumble stuff uh, the 2023 and 2024 Royal Rumbles it was always Cody barely grazing by with Gunther and Gunther making a mistake when it comes to Cody Rhodes. Cody's the guy that Gunther can't figure out. And that overcompensation is what costs Gunther in the end. You know, he took Cody lightly. And if you pay attention to the match, it was Cody working the arm and it was Gunther working the back. Yeah. And the reason why that pinfall happened was Cody 
pin down Gunther's arm. And Gunther was so obsessed with having Cody submit or sleep by choke out. That's what costed him. You know, yep. the arrogance costs him. And that leads to more stories down the line between the two where sure. you can finally have Gunther learn from those mistakes. And he, personally, he's my pick to dethrone Cody for the WWE championship, at least w- if not this time, maybe a different time, because the story is perfect for that. And he, he's officially three and oh, if you include the two eliminations in the Royal Rumble, right? Yeah. If you want to look at it that way and if with, uh, points, right? yeah. And with, with Cody and Gunther, their match was specifically for the story they set up on television. They didn't overcompensate. They didn't, because I feel like there was a next gear that could have been hit. And they didn't really go to that next gear because I feel like they're saving a lot more down the line from when that next match eventually happens. So it was just enough to satisfy everybody for the story they were telling on television. But I feel like the next time that we see them on, like, you know, across the ring from each other, it's going to be a completely different story. And like you said, this was a very Gunther pace match, but this was also a Cody pace match too. I think they these two styles meshed really well. And I think Triple H having the company surrounded by Cody and Gunther was pretty much his plan that was foretold in the 2023 Royal Rumble. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing how all that is playing out today. And I think Triple H picked two great guys to kind of be cornerstones of the WWE brand. Yeah. And do you feel it was the right call to go with Cody instead of Gunther as that crown jewel champ? I think so. Uh, because with Cody, it's like they, they built it up as the first ever crown jewel yeah. champion, right? Should be and, base, really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and like with the ring, which, you know, Cody was struggling to get on on the post show. So I hope <laughs> his fingers. Okay. If you want to add that ring into an angle, let's say it's like they're presenting Cody Rhodes with the ring on SmackDown. Then Kevin Owens like interrupts. Kevin Owens takes the ring, starts beating Cody over the head with it. You know, then you have the crimson mask, and then you have the Kevin Owens Cody angle reignited once again. So you could use that ring as a storytelling device. I feel like if Gunther won over Cody, with Gunther, it's almost gonna make every every other defense that he has after the fact kind of inconsequential because he beat the basically the top babyface that's not named Roman Reigns. Where else do you have to go from there? You like, can't go up since Rome's not on the same show. All you have left is you're going to go down, and that's going to make the opponent look down as well. So Cody winning just kind of sets the bar for the crown jewel, uh, I guess, annual match, uh, whether you like it or not. Personally, I'm ambivalent to it. I don't really care one way or another. It's just kind of there like a I trophy. Know too, yeah. yeah, you know, so... I think Cody was the right call. Gunther doesn't lose anything because of how he lost. You know, it's the overcompensation and it's the uh, taking Cody lightly. And so next time he's not going to take Cody lightly. So he doesn't lose anything, in my opinion. So I'll, I guess I will take the, the Super Bowl ring and the etching of the Stanley Cup for each winner, right? Then back in the day. Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns, and then Roman wins, and that's the Survivor Series main event because that's what the Survivor Series match main, main event is. And then instead of coming up short, Drew loses a inconsequential match, and he's not as big as the guy on SmackDown. And then the same with Big E the year after. He's not as big as the guy on SmackDown. So at least there's some stakes to it opposed than just ha- going out there having an inconsequential match and the loser gets is lesser coming out of it. Right. So I guess I'll take it for what it is and inconsequential. And I don't not taking it that serious is probably the right tone. And I agree with you on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You so, know, it is what it is. Yeah. So that's crown drool 2024 uh, going through it, Richie. I feel that maybe I was a little hard on it, but I just feel that the women's, crown jewel match just being a thing is a little ridiculous they, they shouldn't put those girls out there like that i feel that reed was a little bit disappointing and going through it like i did those maybe i was a little harder on those points but i'm higher on the rest of it and i'm a little low on the bloodline because the bar is so goddamn high and they mm-hmm. can't explode until the war games nor should they right mm-hmm. so all that being said i think it was a successful saturday afternoon C plus B minus show. 
Yeah, you know, it did what it set out to do, you know, progress stories forward. Uh, not many stories were ended here, in my opinion. Uh, the championship matches for the women's tag and the U.S. championship continued and finished like their stories. Every, everything else is still kind of open ended to see if it's continuing again. So it's the it is the definition of a transitionary show. You know, it's not supposed to light the world on fire. It's meant to cross over and kill time rather till the next big show that's on the market. So again, it was a show, you know, it was a show. Uh, again, I didn't have high expectations going into it. I was just like, this is probably going to be, even though the card on paper, a lot of matches I was very interested in seeing in check. It was just kind of like, all right, this, this is how the night's going to go. It's like nothing major is going to be happening. Like at least in WWE canon. So it is what it is. Uh, again, I can give it like, like maybe four out of ten, five out of ten. You know, that might be even a little bit too generous. But again, you know, it's like I'm not offended at the show because I didn't really care about it in the first place. Yeah, well, I would go a little higher than that just because we got like a elite, Cody and Gunther's at least four stars to me. No, so yeah, I agree with that. I would you say know, five's he... probably the basement, and probably six is six is the ceiling if you if you liked more than we liked. But overall, if you're going out of your way, I would check the three way U.S. title match, and I would check the Gunther match out for sure. Two different styles, but two very effective matches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the I rest kind of the Monday night or Smack Monday Night Raw or Friday Night SmackDown is the vibe. It's one of those super shows, you know what I mean? That Raw used to have. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. All right, Richie. Fun as always, and we will see you on the next one, buddy. Thank you for having me.